The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Okay, uh, thank you. So I'm going to talk about running uh, MySQL on Linux, and that will be uh, a reasonably basic presentation because that is a very uh, uh, big sort of kind of song, right? Because most people run uh, MySQL on Linux, uh, as a matter of fact. And I will go over these uh, topics as uh, what kind of feeling distribution we can use, hardware, configuration for MySQL, uh, choice of MySQL information. My sort of integration is kind of on the topic. It's very really briefly, but uh, that's a big deal to cover you how to uh, run the generative uh, MySQL uh, installation in its success. First, let me ask you what kind of uh, distributions, data distributions, do you run in MySQL? Simple. Simple. Large number. 
If you will look at your average web page, for example, using a whole 100 queries per page, that can uh, still produce something like 120 uh, thousands of pages per second. And, can, uh, and if you look at the day measurement, right, even if you account for a spike during the day and uh, slow time during the night, you will be looking at about uh, something like 80,000 pages a day, which essentially single MySQL instances of well support, right? And that's my number, right? I mean, in relation to few apps, I have uh, much more than that, right? So hardware goes uh, a long way with, uh, with, with, with MySQL. This is not to say that we not, uh, don't have to use different MySQL optimization strategies, such as application or charting, that all has its uh, place as well. So then we look at the hardware. What are we going to look for from different contracts? CPU. Well, I would say, you know, the first and foremost, you want to go for faster cores. I have seen so many people instead say, oh, I want to buy many cores even if they're slower, sometimes significantly slower. And that is not very good choice of high score. Because then you, your cores are fast, it will benefit all applications, right? Independent of what kind of parents you have. The large amount of cores, let's say going over 24, will only benefit when you can actually maintain that level of concurrency. And also when the MySQL and integration system in China can really scale to provide <coughs> execution of all those number of cores. In the majority of workloads, I think uh, even on two sockets of, I would say, you know, eight core system threads right, each, you will have some scarcity with the past. Right? That's uh, their uh, majority of the case. Typically, you don't need to go to, uh, to more than that. Memory. Memory, I would say, is uh, typically or often the most important component of your performance, right? Because wherever your CPUs are, if you cannot really uh, fit amount of data in memory, you have to go to the disk all the time instead. Even if that disk is flat, it can slow things down so much compared to having an even slower uh, uh, CPU. So it's very important for, the, for your working set to feel wet in memory, right, for, from a uh, uh, standpoint of uh, uh, getting a good uh, performance. And you also have to understand that there is a good, there is this kind of interesting relationship between memory and I.O. system. The less memory you have, the more cash misses you will have, in a sense, right? That means the more demand there will be from your I.O. system. And on the contrary, right? If you can fit all your database in memory, then after warm up, you won't have to do any needs at all, right? Because there will be a cache. So the demand on your IOS system will be substantially lower. And this is what is mainly important for memory uh, when it comes to MySQL. Uh, go for size first and foremost, mm -hmm. right? In some cases, I see people uh, installing, for example, half a month of memory but getting a little bit faster speed, right? Typically, that's not for the trade, right? So, size typically goes first, and then the uh, high performance memory uh, second. Storage. When it comes to storage, is the fastest performance you can get with the directly attached uh, flash, such as uh, PCI Express cards you can get from Fusion IO, VDNs. Now, a lot of other guys like Micron, Aztec, Intel are also on the market. Those guys are fastest because they don't have to go through, let's say, SATA or SAS interface and you know, try to pretend to be a hard drive. Directly PCI Express, very low latency, very high performance, right? And these are the fastest. Now, at the same time, when it comes to uh, serial uh, uh, SATA SSDs, right, or SAS SSDs, these are often very cost effective. In fact, I would say they are uh, right now often very comparable in the price to your highest performance uh, rotating media hard drive, right? If you look at those 15K RPM 2.5 inch drives, they are pretty expensive, right? Of uh, automatic flash. Then, uh, what is important in this case, though, is if you're using the flash, mine 
uh, vendors and also uh, do some monitoring for uniform performance. When we speak about the disk spinning media, right, we understand that they are all essentially the same. Right? I mean, you can even put the uh, hard drives to a, from a different vendors in the same way, right, and it will work quite fine. We go by the specs. If it's 15K RPM, 2.5 inches, size, well, that's what we care about. That is completely different with Flash, where every single vendor really has a uh, hardware which behaves different. There is a lot of proprietary and complicated <coughs> out there inside, right? And they're all designed inside uh, very different, right? It's actually quite complicated beasts uh, uh, inside. And you can have a very different performance from it. For example, we've seen the software drives which would perform well, but then sometimes they see, oh, we haven't been doing enough garbage collection, so for maybe a significant period of time, they'll go in a very slow performance mode when they try to catch it, right, or uh, things like that. You really want to uh, understand that, especially if you are going for uh, budget clusters. Then you go for RAID, yeah, which is uh, uh, in, in an important choice, you want to ensure two things. If you are using the conventional hard drives, know that they are very slow for writes, right? Uh, uh, especially for uh, writes. And you can get much faster writes acknowledgement if you have battery backup cache on them, which is very important for uh, the transactional database such as MySQL, right? So uh, you have a choice, always go for that. And I would even consider going behind the uh, bit uh, further than that by looking at their systems which don't have a battery bank per se, but they which have a uh, kind of hybrid uh, redundancy method, the uh, capacitor and the flash. So they, you don't have those battery loading processors. So do we know what that is? Probably telling, right? That sometimes this BBU system often have to disable the cache and then do some loading and training, wherever by discharging the battery, testing and charging the battery, right? That can serve the battery performance. And then we use an SSD refresh. That is important that uh, what your rate is actually SSD capable. Because a lot of their um, older Rate controllers which have been designed for the speed and media, they can't really uh, deal with the amount of IOs the flash can provide. And they themselves often will become the uh, button. When you look at the rate choices, uh, I would say uh, the rate 10 is the best choice for uh, a workload of MySQL. It's the most predictable performance and simple enough. Sometimes, you will have to be pushed to, uh, to something else. For example, if you really can't afford to double your sort of uh, raw storage requirements of RAID 10, you may be pushed uh, to write RAID 5, and that can be feasible for read most applications, and especially if you can uh, have, let's say, multiple slaves. So if, if you know it's suffered hard drive failure, uh, you can uh, really fail over to something else. Uh, because performance overhead from failed RAID 5 can be very substantial, right? I mean, uh, from, uh, especially during their uh, rebuild process. Going back to performance and memory, this is a graph which shows us uh, the system performance, that's kind of a number of transactions set, depending on the amount of memory we have. And in this case, we have a system range of about 18 uh, gigs of memory. You can see what happens is first, there uh, are a kind of small buffer pool, performance grows very slow, right? You can see at this stage, uh, we have increased memory three times, but performance increased mainly only 50%, right? So it, it lasts. Then you can have this sort of acceleration <coughs> when it gets faster. I mean, uh, the incremental memory provides us more and more substantial performance improvements, right? Until, uh, well, we expect to uh, reach, reach a plateau, right? That all our data fits in memory plus uh, something else, like there is some uh, other data structure which is inside the buffer pool. 
everything fits here. Right? Now, what is interesting in this case, you can see how dramatic jump was from 18 gigs to 20 in terms of power. You see, it's uh, essentially more than double performance for 10% data size of you, right? Before we find it out. Now, these graphs could be uh, look at usually different for your application, but I think it's uh, the idea is the same. What is very interesting in the case <coughs> is what well, as you go up, you can always go down. Think about this, if you have a fixed amount of memory and your data set continues to grow, right? Then you may end up here. When your database size increases only 10%, while the throughput database can sustain, can grow to half, right? And this is a worst case scenario, but uh, and it may be similar to that. So that I think is a, uh, very important to monitor uh, in your system and to understand where you are, so you're not caught by surprise, right? And things are just saying this week as we were last week, no big changes, and my database just <coughs> feels very bad today. <coughs> Here is another interesting uh, observation about their uh, storage and memory which I saw uh, called the compression of performance gains. On this graph, I look at number of storage systems. We do the same benchmark with using I.O., which is fastest. Even though SSD, right, I think it was maybe 320 or something, which is sort of the mid-range. And the rate 10 of the 800, right, which is our uh, well, slow uh, storage. You can see what initially, when you just have a 4 uh, gigabytes, there is a pretty large difference in this case between them. Right? It's uh, uh, probably about 5 eggs between Fusion IO, uh, in this case, and Ray. Now, as uh, uh, we can see their growth, uh, as we grow towards more and more memory kits, the difference between those are two things. Right, so somewhere here, the difference is twice. And then as we get close to this level, well, uh, the fusion IO now barely gives us maybe 20% extra performance, right? So I think that's important to understand what the, the, the impact of the fast storage will be more significant the more memory kits that you have. And so sometimes the choice may be not getting the much faster performance, <coughs> but getting more memory. So for example, if they are looking at something of this sort, it's much easier for me to buy a little bit extra memory, right, to go to say from here to here, than to invest with Fusion IO, right, which costs uh, a lot more compared to my uh, uh, even array out of the equal SSD graphics, right? That's a very important selection of what you have to do for the store. <coughs> and now we can kind of go, uh, go into more of um, a uh, different specific thing, which is alignment, right? Then we speak about the alignment, we want to care, uh, well, first of all, the alignment that uh, comes to RAID, right? When you have uh, RAID set in multiple contracts, you will have uh, stripe of certain size, right? Let's say 64K, maybe 56K. Now, uh, when we speak about alignment, we are saying is what we want to make sure when we set up a partition on the stripe boundary, not somewhere in the middle, but align with those stripe size. And then we also want to set up their file system alignment options through a stripe argument right or different file system call it differently. So file system knows how large our great, uh, great stripe is and then we can optimize its data structures and I.O. in the consideration of our physical display, right? I will uh, provide some links that you can follow uh, when you get uh, access to the slides and read more background, but I just wanted to share some uh, benchmarks in this case. And uh, you can see what, uh, uh, in some cases, especially when you are speaking about the high uh, high concurrency, right, and there is a lot of threads issued a lot of concurrent IO requests, they can be pretty significant gains with uh, uh, essentially misaligned 
and align the setup. In this case, that can give you an average 20% of performance, right? Or up to 20%, especially free of charge just by uh, setting up your partition and passing some options, right? Network. When it comes to network, what do you care about? Well, latency. Right? Latency is uh, the most important. Very rarely you would see MySQL just hitting their you know, good enough network from a proper standpoint. But latency is uh, all, always uh, important. So what that means is from an application standpoint, we want to have as many queries, uh, as few queries, right, and, uh, and as such, well, around each page as possible. From a network standpoint, that also means that we want to minimize the number of hops between data and the website, right? If you just connect it through a single switch, <coughs> that's great, right? If not, well, sometimes it's not possible. You want to minimize that as much as possible. Sometimes I've seen uh, networks which are not set up with this consideration, and physically you can look at that connectivity going through so much stuff, right? so, so much stuff, right? It really can triple the latency from what you uh, really should get. Database link, we have one gigabit at least. And it should be set up, right? And this is focused with uh, available days of things, but uh, I have seen a number of mistakes when port have been not set up correctly, right, on some of the devices. And uh, even if you don't have one gig or it's not set up with a full loop, it's which is again can be pretty bad for performance. And 10 gigabit is also driving again, uh, getting more popular those days. And it really doesn't really improve your latency 10 times, it can be very helpful, mm -hmm. especially those applications when you travel around with all the data. For example, if you need to transfer I don't know, the one terabyte database through one node to another to backup or a cluster setup, then 10 gigabit link will allow you to do that much faster. Especially if you're doing flash, right? Because flash can, I mean, with, uh, with sort of conventional storage, right, the open would be bound by storage. How fast it can be compared to uh, one gigabit uh, link. With flash, it can easily provide you know, a few gigabytes of free even if those are random, right? So that's what uh, kind of a game you can talk about. Uh, monitoring is also important in this case, right? I would suggest to monitor both particle loss uh, uh, and latency. Because a lot of the latency on application level, it doesn't come from their uh, latency at the network level, but rather packet loss. In this case, let's say if I'm trying to set up connection, the packet loss of that called SIM packet will typically pose the three seconds delay. Right? And that's a lot, right, compared to me. <laughs> you wouldn't uh, typically get as much uh, latency even from a very bad network. And what is also interesting for uh, the MySQL DBA is that I see network problems are often blamed on database. Because your application, you could say, hey, I'm trying to connect to database and it takes me three seconds to connect to database, right? Where that's a database which is built. We don't really understand what that means in network connectivity and database doing just fine. And I think it's very important to monitor network so you can understand the difference between those two. Network now, I would say in uh, most typical MySQL uh, installations, you will define the default, right? You don't need to tune every single one of them. Depending on the load, some people shovel a lot of traffic to provide the result set. Some people have a lot of connections uh, or connections coming from large amounts of different hosts right, or some other setup. There may be some settings which you want to, uh, to apply. And I have got to create the most uh, typical settings here, right? So we don't, may want to infuse my SIM backlog, we may want to tune my SQL itself to infuse the backlog, right? So we can really uh, create, uh, really accept a lot of threads connected at the very, very same period of time. We may want to allow uh, a lot of uh, more local ports, right? When you have uh, connections created and destroyed completely, right? From a small amount of of web host that's the important. We may also want to increase the amount of uh, virus buffers, right, and uh, and key, key level or on device. Again, right, uh, uh, these are not something that we have to do with every single 
said about uh, uh, some kind of uh, samples can be uh, very helpful. Another uh, uh, thing to consider with network is, especially when you have many connections which you want to be created and destroyed, persistent connections may be quite uh, important. And note that the MySQL, especially with the thread pool of writing in MySQL Enterprise, with one server, or uh, more easily, can handle very large number of connections. I mean, you can have a MySQL with 10,000 connections, right, which are persistent connections and they're just using the uh, technique. There are also wireless setups with the proxy inside the uh, in between, and you can maintain persistent connection through a proxy in a sense, right, and then uh, connect it and disconnect uh, that. Question of the uh, virtualization uh, and the cloud. Now, let me ask uh, the, the audience here. So, how many here runs my school on the bare metal? Okay. How many of you run uh, virtualized my school? And how many of you go around my school in the cloud? Nobody else? Oh, okay. That's interesting. Uh, anyway, so uh, what is important to understand here in those two components? First is what their uh, virtualization has been cost, right, from the phone to the mm -hmm. I mean, virtualization is great, provides a lot of benefits, right, but just to remember, nothing in this whole uh, is free. And depending on a lot of conditions, right, the overhead may be very small or pretty large. And what we the best advice is, uh, well, if you have choices, right, uh, to do benchmarks. Especially if you're considering to migrate from uh, bare metal to virtualized environment, do benchmark. Because sometimes I've seen people just assuming or reading some marketing material about those, let's say, 5% overhead and then they migrate, it's, oops, it's actually 55%. <laughs> Surprise, right? You don't want to be caught uh, in this way. So, test it before you make a move. The thing in cloud is, cloud really provides a high performance hardware, right? So, as I was saying, hey, we can get this video box with a very good flash and uh, more than half a terabyte of memory. Well, uh, mm -hmm. that doesn't quite exist in the cloud. Or it can be very expensive. I would say, though, over the last year, Two years, cloud is getting a lot better. They understand for some users as my school that is important. The flash is now available right in the, uh, on the Amazon, which is the live cloud provider. Also, we are, can get now up to about 240 gigs of RAM in the, uh, the, in the instances, which is actually pretty good, right? Like a year before, it wouldn't go more than 60, uh, 68. So, there are the uh, choices here, but in general, if you're running virtualized MySQL or if you are running MySQL uh, uh, but virtualized, you're not alone, a lot of people are doing it. Before we get to uh, this piece, I wanted to say, hey, I forgot something. And I forgot speaking about the storage to talk about uh, non direct attack storage, right? So, anybody here is a uh, software that is running MySQL on Sun? On us. Okay. So I would actually mention this, right? Uh, it's important to know that if you are looking for the highest performance right now, right, or highest performance at lower cost, that wouldn't be a standard on system, right? I mean, the direct attack flash, which uh, is what uh, is going to give you. Typically, people run sun or NAS systems for different reasons. Right, they may be looking for uh, dynamic capacity change in right for their storage or being able to deal with the uh, scale performance. Let's say I have an application which I want to go from consuming, I don't know, let's say just 100 IOPS and then it requires 10,000 IOPS and I don't want to move to a different server, right? Sun and NAS solutions can provide that. They can also help us with for things like the storage level replication or uh, consolidated kind of. <coughs> Uh, backups and snaps and other good features, right? You often will use those things for features, and if it's fine, just make sure you uh, you understand why you are given uh, given those choices. My perhaps the most uh, biggest kind of concern was people said, "Oh, we moved from Solution X to Sun for their 
performance and it's not working well. Cause is not working well because you don't move the sun for, uh, for performance, right? Especially for latent. Something to know about the MySQL is compared to some other servers, the MySQL may not issue as many concurrent IO requests as you would imagine, right? And a lot of things like some solutions, they have a lot of power behind them. They are able to solve a lot of concurrent requests. But the latency uh, may have that option. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's go to the uh, Linux configuration. I will want to repeat, but for most workloads, the same as going back to this network stuff, Linux routes my runs my so surprisingly well. Right? I mean it's not like you really must go in and tune all kinds of stuff <coughs> or pair with the dragons and you'll only get a ten percent of the performance you could possibly get, right? Linux is not Windows XP. Right? So it all works uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking about Windows right now, yeah. Both So when it comes to general configuration, what do we uh, care? Well, one is uh, SKA right? Uh, unless your security requirements require, and you know what that is, I would uh, suggest to disable that for two reasons. Reason number one, the MySQL is typically there, uh, or often the only tenant on your box anyway. Right, so the SA Linux, which has a big tent of protection between different tenants, processes, well, it may not be needed anyway, right? I mean, the, the database which MySQL has an access as a process to is the only viable thing on your database box uh, anyway. Okay. I don't want to swear on camera. <laughs> okay. different 
measure that kind of uh, map to different um, uh, different CPUs, uh, and th that means uh, their kernel tries to allocate memory uh, appropriately to make it uh, faster for access from a given thread, which is bound to the same CPU. Uh, that doesn't work very well with the mice for buffer size, right? Because uh, and sometimes uh, it can be allocated so it belongs to only a single NUMA area, uh, and that can cause uh, swapping to happen even if uh, very technically uh, and not kind of available. Otherwise, you will need a lot of kind of uh, rather complicated background for that. Well, what is important here is what the uh, latest story mice will you want to typically to set up the uh, e interleaven with uh, uh, Numa CTL. And in the corner server, uh, that is the uh, author of Mike and Dan in the uh, Star Street uh, for it. So let's talk a bit about the storage configuration. Now, one thing I mm -hmm. very much like to set, uh, to, uh, to set up is to separate operation system and MySQL partition. Right? So if I ever want to do something with my MySQL partition, let's say, hey, I want to do a new file system, right? I don't have to use the my operation system. And there is uh, some other good uh, reason to that as well. I just can CEQ is uh, often default, and that doesn't work very well for MySQL work, at least in many kind of combinations. Depending on the storage you use, you hear a deadline on the knob maybe offering you the best, uh, uh, best performance. And you can either uh, do, uh, do the same by elevated deadline on the kernel boot uh, options, or you can change it from uh, CCFS and running file system. If you're running MySQL, it also may be very uh, helpful to increase their uh, queue size in terms of number of requests the device can accept. All right, that can um, provide substantial performance gain. I would also suggest to consider using uh, LVM, LVM attached store. It provides you a lot of very good features, and unless you are actually creating the snapshot or something like that, it is uh, doesn't have uh, any significant overhead. Okay, right? So just trying LVM is uh, uh, it is pretty much free. Section of LVM, I would uh, still suggest to reserve some space for snapshots. Because snapshots can be uh, mm -hmm. very uh, valuable feature sometimes, even if you are, you know, let's say, running your backup to some uh, different end. File systems. So, what file systems do you guys use? Standard. Hmm? So, you got four. Huh? Standard. XC4. Anything else? Just in EC4? ZFS. Huh? ZFS. ZFS, on it, it's my spell. Sure. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Hmm? Anybody else oh. want to stop us using the Razor Fest or something? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, what do we see used, right? If, uh, XFS. That is, I would say, the old. High performance memory, right? It was always working to a much better than ext3. Uh, a lot of people use it, it works pretty well. ext4 uh, actually works uh, pretty well as well. In some workloads, it, it works uh, better than, mm, than xfs, sometimes significantly better. Now, things which uh, can be, uh, I would say, mm -hmm. avoided. ext2, obviously, you don't want to have non transactional. File system with transactional database, right? You care about today. EXT3 has a lot of violence. Contention or removing large files from except for the EXT3. Mm -hmm. Well, and database often have large files, right? Can really revoke the server for a long period of time. Great interface, right? Uh, well, I haven't uh, have seen that in a while. Now, ZFX, right? I'm saying, why can't we write with the we don't want to use ZFS for now, right? It just went GA, right, in master. Well, uh, we had a number of customers jumping into ZFS, and on the high load, it has employment problems, right? They had many, many problems with that, so we wouldn't uh, recommend uh, ZFS. I think it's uh, ZFS on Linux, right? And I would make it clear. Uh, it's 
seems to be have still a lot of uh, groups to work out for how to win database workload. We have it been more successful in using the ZFS for things like batch, right? Which is, which is not so demanding for some system. And which is great. It's deduplication, compression, great. Fun system too. Few, a few things which uh, may or may not be very important to us. Um, we don't want more time real time, uh, real time, right? So typically we don't want to maintain the access time for files, especially if you have a database which has a lot of files, right? Uh, like a lot of databases, many files, tables, a lot of tables of MySQL, many files, tables, stuff like that. Uh, we also want to tune uh, something with uh, file system txt and txt4 sometimes. Uh, I would uh, mention what typically we want to uh, maybe remove reserve, reserve space for root, and I like to set it to remount with only one error. The thing you don't want to have with the database is uh, file system to con continue kind of working and providing you some data, even if it discovered some internal inconsistencies, right? You want at least at least we don't need it for uh, and then uh, in XFS we often want to configure it in, with no barrier barrier option for very performance. Assuming you are uh, using the right barrier type that unit for flash. Okay. MySQL variants, uh, let me call it this way. So there are three main ones I would say. Let me ask you how many of you are running MySQL coming into enterprise Okay. Any other runs for ADD? Any other runs for the server? Okay. Uh, good. So there are uh, three main choices which you can uh, uh, that you can use right for uh, main workloads. They all will uh, work uh, very well, and, and each has their own kind of unique uh, advantages. You can have. In terms of versions. The newer versions are often the most uh, scalable and also kind of some other, other features. Right, so what do you guys run? Anybody runs uh, MySQL 5.6? Huh? Okay. 5.5? Five, five. Five, five, one. 5.0? 5.1 and below, anybody? Okay, well. Good, so we can see what the majority of use right now is in 5.5 uh, five, five to 5.1 five, five space, right? That's something what uh, I uh, really would expect. Uh, I don't guys know when MySQL 5.6 is out, they also have their uh, performance surveys in MySQL 5.6 coming out, um, I think in the next month or so, we have a uh, release candidate out now. Uh, but I see it's, uh, I would say, I think the adoption of MySQL 56 has been uh, relatively slow uh, uh, so far. Uh, but I would still uh, see uh, if you're starting a new development, it's uh, good to start with uh, MySQL 56 and plan to automate it in the next uh, three to six months. I think it will uh, be up to you know, a couple of more releases. I would expect the most of the groups will be uh, really worked out. And it's really uh, MySQL 5.6 really delivers. It's pretty good. Uh, so it releases a lot of uh, scalability and performance demands. How do you want to install it right, for MySQL variants? First, I would say the best way to do it is to really use repositories. Once you connect your system to one of those repositories, it will be easier for you to, uh, to update MySQL right, or uh, install a version that should be. Prefer. Downloading the packages, the JJM, RPM, or whatever is an other uh, choice again that makes it a lot easier to uh, install, install, upgrade, or whatever. The next choice in my own approach is would be to use some target zip files. There are some issues that because the target zip typically they're not produced for every single operation system combination, you will have some generic 64-bit Linux, which may have some performance and compatibility issues, mm -hmm. right? It may not be compiled the best compiler for your variant right now. And so, but it's very good for testing. For example, MySQL sandbox. If you want to test different versions, 
it's much easier to download a bunch of target zips, set up my school sandbox, and you can test how you behave, right? And, uh, and, whatever. and also, you can, of course, go and do your own, right? I would say, unless you are doing some significant changes to MySQL, like Facebook or Twitter are doing, I would suggest you uh, uh, not doing that because there is really a lot into to engage in MySQL. I mean, wherever the vendors you're looking for, they really invest a lot. There's like a literally large part of systems running millions of tests, tests on those builds. Uh, which are uh, being created. And we have seen all those kind of weird stuff. Some sort of libraries don't really work well in MySQL and those structures, or some even compiler versions may be unsafe, right? So for safety reasons, I would suggest you avoid uh, that uh, unless you build your own MySQL, uh, unless you like, really have a good reason uh, to do that. We have also seen all kind of hard build mistakes. For example, people would Compile my school in the lab mode and put it in production <coughs> and enjoy uh, the whole 10% of performance data, you know, potentially. Yeah. My school is great. Now, the thing with my school, well, even if my school 5.6 is approved, defaults, my school defaults are not good enough for major uh, uh, operations. So you need to review and tune at least some uh, of. Now, typically, you just get, have to get a few configuration options right, right? For most workloads, you can set five, maybe ten of them. Exactly what you need, have to get, get to almost all the way through what the system is uh, capable of, of, of delivering. I have another talk about the uh, MySQL configuration, which is linked here. You can uh, provide, you can just check the link out in the Google MySQL, optimize MySQL configuration. That's a fact. For this law, I will mention what? Just few important options, or all for NGV, which you often have, uh, always have to check. NGV is not a full time. That is your cache. That has a most significant impact on your performance on a high, uh, high volume. Typically, you would set that to something around 80% of your memory. Sometimes a bit more, sometimes a bit less, but that's uh, a lot of traffic. In a new class method, uh, all direct, right? in most cases you don't want uh, things to be double cached both in my school and in the operation system. I get there are some exceptions to that, but typically that's only what we have. In the low file size, this is very, very important for the right area application. The large logs uh, size you set, and I would suggest setting up to 256 megs or more. They're better in my school to handle the right volume, right volume, but the longer recovery time you may get. Right? So that's something you have to consider. In terms of crash, the recovery time is somewhat proportional to the size of the log file. Right? So you may want to uh, test that to make sure your uh, log file and recovery time, a log file uh, keeps your recovery time. And then that one is in the flight of the Ferris I mean, And I have a question mark here because there is no exact right model for everybody. This is a decision you have to make. Decision about what kind of data consistency guarantees you uh, need to have. If you want to data for fully durable, so when you commit the data, it is there, persistent on the disk, you want to set it to one. If you don't, if you are uh, say it's okay for you if uh, there is a chance that <coughs> my school server crashes, you will lose the data for the last couple of seconds, then uh, you can set the device flow with your to two. Right. These are the two most uh, practical options. Here are mm, some more advanced ideas you might consider. Sometimes you have so much power on the system you cannot really use only a single MySQL instance on it. In this case, uh, when you run multiple instances in MySQL, sometimes you can get better performance by binding them to certain CPU, CPU cores. So they don't really uh, mm -hmm. jump back and forth, right? That's the uh, kind of the task that 
Another uh, opportunity sometimes is work with memory allocation. You may use uh, Gmo log write or Pissima log, which was an old favorite, and sometimes it can substantially improve your performance in high concurrency. Again, in, uh, in performance server, there is an uh, option to uh, enable uh, <coughs> Gmo log with uh, out of the box. Some other uh, good idea. I mentioned LDL itself. I think an LDL set of bicycle can be used very well to maintain uh, operations. If you can pay for snapshot overhead, it's often a good idea to create a snapshot before you do maintenance. Because if things go wrong, right? For example, you update MySQL, start that, and it corrupted your database, right? If you have a snapshot with LDM, the new versions you can uh, actually promote that snapshot <coughs> in your file system and sort of restore the database into original state very quickly. Much faster than a sort of whole database from back. Right? Can be very uh, Now another thing to know with uh, Linux is I would kind of beware of the scripts, right? And I will talk about two scripts to beware, which can be distributions and which are um, not always practical, but we all leave with them because of well, um, no we want to break the release. Maybe Oracle guys can read it and uh, fix it. <laughs> right. So what are we gonna apply? Well, timeouts. Timeouts, well, uh, our starting top scripts they come with timeouts and often they're not safe enough. Especially for shutdown. If I have a large buffer pool and slow risks, it may take my MySQL an hour to say to shut down, right? Well, if I just do my school stop, it will time out within a few seconds, and maybe then I will type to factory boot right in my database will be able to shut down normally and all the good stuff, right? We don't want that to happen. Just be aware of those timeouts. Sometimes in those cases I will use my school shutdown instead of using the uh, start of the stop script, which will wait for <coughs> as long as it needs. Another thing I would say is uh, some scripts can be uh, automated upgrade or even database check, right? which can be um, very much uh, inappropriate, especially for NHB tables. Right? I mean, why would you need to check NHB tables for corrupt? That doesn't need to do that. But sometimes that may trigger when you have some very heavy script running in the background or you're trying to start MySQL and it is not really uh, starting. Well, for you because there is an upgrade to the check and things like that. Another word that I do kind of and see people often beaten by is this DPK, uh, DPKG post post and tell scripts. Sometimes they can use install you know, my school or grade my school. Something gets wrong and you get their binary installed, but it won't be able to, I don't know, say upgrade the tables or something like that. Then what you'll see in the Debian is package is left in so called an unfair configured state. Chances are you will be able to start by school successfully and just run absolutely fine, but later on somebody will want to install a different package in the system. And what will happen is DPKG will discover, oh, there is my school system server which wasn't configured here. Let me configure that right now. Let me shut it down. Right? And then do something else. So you may be doing something pretty benign, like they ins uh, installed some small script right? from, uh, from a record, and you can get the whole MySQL server went down uh, without any kind of big warning. Right? So a lot of people get beaten by this, right? And, and Oracle guys, you can fix that. I know you can. Affirmation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, anybody uh, have their deployment automated with Linux? Any, any break so? Okay. So that is a, a very, very uh, good thing to do because manual approach doesn't scale and that is also error prone, right? So no less you will miss it. So it's very good to optimize installation upgrades, optimize the uh, deployment in proper configuration, right? Especially on the large scale. 
There are a number of tools available for that. You can just type a chat, and similarly as other tools like CF Engine, and I think there's like tons of channels you can uh, use. They all have their merits, and I don't care what you use, it was what they use them. And also, I would make sure to uh, point out to keep your configuration uh, deployment as well as MySQL configuration, MySQL under version control, so you often know what has changed, <coughs> right, and uh, possibly why, right, to the point. Monitor and training. That also is very important, right, for uh, successfully running uh, MySQL. What do you want to, to use here? Well, there are many tools, right, to choose from. So just make sure that you are uh, doing it. Nagios and Factive are uh, popular tools. If you use those, <coughs> I would suggest to use the, uh, to, to check out the MySQL to find a monitor plugin, which provide you with uh, Nagios checks right, and some fancy uh, Factive graph. Right? As a plugin for Oracle guys, here will also supply the MySQL Enterprise Monitor, right? Any day. Um, Oh, I'll see if I'm playing my spell the price monitor. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that also can do uh, pretty fancy. Uh, and also what I like a lot uh, if you do uh, an advanced uh, my school, which is tool called uh, graphic. It's a very good tool if you need to do some advanced analysis and correlation and can, can do a lot of fancy stuff. Anybody come from the uh, other graphic here? So, oh. what's another kind of random advanced thing up there? Mm -hmm. What follows the problem? That is Linux out of memory killer, uh, kill, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody run into this guy? Mm -hmm. All right. So it can kill the stuff, right? And that may not be stuff you want to be killed. So uh, you want to define priorities, and you can configure or configure appropriately, right? What would be typically my priority, right? Well, I all, I never want to have my SSH server killed because I want to be able to log into the box and browse the server, right? That's my first priority. Then uh, I want my MySQL server to probably stay up, if possible, at all, right? Because if it's killed, they probably would have to do database recovery and it takes time, right? Avoid the kills. But at the same time, I think uh, there are often some batch jobs, backups, or any other kind of process which start the random interval which is very handy to kill, right? And you can adjust things appropriately. You can use this uh, option like minus 17 for the proper pass to, to, to never kill the process, right? Or you can configure some process to be killed more likely. Okay. So do you say, do you show me two minutes? Two. Two minutes, okay. Oh, we're almost gonna time, right? Tools, what do you want to know on uh, Linux? I won't have uh, time to go in detail, so I will just uh, mention you those and refer you to Google the manual things. Linux start, I will start top, very you know, conventional tools, very happy to understand what is going on, my school is not Express. If something weird is going on, S trace is your very good friend, right? To really trace, yeah, especially if you have something like permission errors or whatnot. Or profile. In case of performance analysis, especially CPU bound, that's a great tool to understand what is happening there, why uh, system is taking so much uh, uh, my CPU, especially when you see CPU between the system level, right? Because then you can really profile that for MySQL tools. GDP. We often use MySQL for tools like PT stall or something called the Kurman profile to see that MySQL stalls, where exactly in the source code it stalls. So you can uh, maybe Google that, right? Even if you don't know MySQL code, uh, or uh, a reporting guide, right? Or you know, support case or help. And Performance Toolkit also helps to uh, automate a lot of uh, a lot of DBA work, right, as well as uh, help the, the travel through the MySQL pieces in many cases. There is like four, I mean, 40 different tools out there, uh, which I don't suggest you have. Well, where we can uh, do one more, we are going to provide training for those who want more in depth information about MySQL, webinars, a 
as well. Uh, you can check out where we have that we need for the 50 different webinars which are available here through both slides and a very important free of charge from our website. And then also, uh, I would say check out the proceeds from a MySQL uh, conference that's one live. We just uh, took place in April where we used a lot of uh, great slides published out there and they're very good uh, covers. If you're looking forward in the future, then uh, uh, we have their, uh, oh Lord, the MySQL Connect. It's happening in September, I think. Yes, and then uh, we have a conference uh, in Athens, San Francisco, and uh, if there's anybody who likes to travel, we have a conference that's going to live taking place in London in, uh, in November this year. And that's, that's it, with probably about 10 seconds to spare. <laughs> Perfect. Great. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. Then, as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast; uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project, is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and uh, 
and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astra Space systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astra or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astra. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. 
Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.